Now, the technique's been around since probably 1968, 69, in one form or another. Uh, and actually, the first person to work with it was David Muir, uh, who was at the Institute for Occupational Medicine in Edinburgh and did a lot of co-workers' pneumoconiosis work, uh, was very well known for it. Uh, but uh, the, the technique was really not well understood until about the, the mid-1980s. That was when I was starting to work on it. Uh, I was at New York University. In fact, this was my doctoral dissertation. Uh, but in the intervening years between then and now, uh, there have been about 50 papers published on the technique. So um, a lot of people have looked at it, mostly in Europe. Uh, the Germans were very interested in this. And so a lot of the, a lot of the papers were done there, although there, there are still several here in the U.S. Um, so we think that uh, based upon the data that's been collected to date, uh, we've got a pulmonary function test uh, that we think may provide earlier detection for several reasons. Uh, first of all, the, the test is easier to do. It does not require forced maneuver. And uh, secondly, because it doesn't require a forced maneuver, it's faster to do. Uh, it takes as long as it takes to breathe in and breathe out. That's pretty much it. Uh, training with it is, is not terribly complex. And I'll show you what that looks like, but it's mostly getting a person to breathe a, a given volume with an indicator on the screen. Uh, they don't have to breathe at any particular rate. They just have to breathe to a particular volume, mostly so we know where to uh, put the test aerosol, uh, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, and we think it's more sensitive because uh, since it doesn't require a forced maneuver, you can do multiple tests on a single patient, uh, thus improving uh, your power and thus the sensitivity of the test by signal averaging. Um, I also have some information if we have time to, to work, uh, to get to it. Uh, I've been working with one of the biochemists here who's been looking at some Chinese medications. He had worked a number of years ago with Tetrandrine, uh, with Vince Castronova at NIOSH, uh, looking at the benefits of Tetrandrine. And he has another substance now that's, that's being commonly used, I guess, in China, uh, for, uh, treating fibrogenesis. Uh, it's a uh, dihydroberberine, which is anti-inflammatory, a uh, calcium channel blocker, and because it comes from a plant, it's labeled as a supplement. Next slide. So first of all, the aerosol spirometry. Uh, now, aerosol spirometry has gone by a couple of different names. Uh, aerosol dispersion or bolus dispersion was the first uh, title, and where um, what you'll see in a lot of the publications that have been done today. Uh, we've called it aerosol spirometry here uh, because uh, we understood very quickly that uh, pulmonologists and physicians and everybody else does not want uh, a new in index number uh, that no one understands. And so we've been trying to show that we can correlate the results of the aerosol dispersion test with uh, standard pulmonary function and thereby convert the, the values from aerosol dispersion into something that is understandable like spirometry. And so we've uh, used and, and historically what's been used has been the FEV1, FVC percent predicted ratio. And uh, we get a, a reasonable correlation with that, uh, something on the order of 0.7 to 0.8. Um, we've also been correlating it with plethysmography because the test, as you'll see, will give you um, something that is proportional to either compliance or resistance. And so uh, uh, compliance is what we're doing mostly with spirometry and resistance we've done with plethysmography. And plethysmography being a slightly more sensitive test, we think, we get a higher correlation coefficient of 0.9 to 0.95 with the test. And that's mostly being done here at, at WVU. And the way the test works um, is that you have a subject breathing through a tube. The tube has a photometer in it. Uh, you introduce a pulse of an aerosol. Uh, 
uh, while keeping track of the person's volume breathed in through a, a pneumatac and a pressure transducer. And uh, as the aerosol runs through the photometer, you get a pulse. Um, the pulse of the aerosol is the aerosol all going in at the same time. And so now the aerosol essentially becomes a timer. So you breathe it in and you breathe it back out. And you look at the distribution of time rates for each of the aerosol particles. So in a sense, each of the aerosol particles is acting as a micro stopwatch. Um, we know from basic physiology that each of the pathways in the lung from the uh, mouth to the alveolus and back out again has a time constant associated with it. The time constant is the product of resistance and compliance. And so what we're seeing is the distribution of time constants, which gives us the distribution of uh, compliance and resistance for each of the pathways uh, that the aerosol is going down in the lung. Next slide. Um, and so um, essentially what we're doing is looking at lung ventilation because ventilation is the mixing of CO2 and oxygen in the lung. And so by being able to put an aerosol in, in the next slide, uh, just go ahead, yeah. By putting an aerosol in, we're tracing the amount of ventilation, the amount of mixing that's going on. And we know we can trace the amount of mixing because this bolus technique, inserting a tracer bolus, is basically standard chemical engineering. There are whole textbooks written on this, the topic. And so <clears throat> the interpretation of it and the mathematics of it has actually all been worked out by the chemical engineers. They're very familiar with this, but most physicians don't have a background in chemical engineering. So we do wanna be able to translate this into something that's readily understandable by the medical community. Uh, next slide. And so what we see is an input in the first slide on the left. And uh, if you were a chemical engineer, you'd wanna know what happened to that input in a perfectly mixed mixing chamber. And if the mixing chamber were in fact completely stirred and perfectly mixed, you'd see this exponential function on the outflow from the, the mixing vessel. And if you then took that outflow and put it through another well-mixed uh, tank, uh, you'd see something that in fact no longer looks like an exponential. It looks like this uh, distribution. And <coughs> the more tanks you put it through, the more the distribution changes. And one of the parameters in the distribution is a value that we've called P here, just taking it from the chemical literature. And P is the number of chambers in series. So it tells you how many well-mixed chambers you've gone through, which tells you something about the mixing procedure. Uh, along with that, there is another parameter, beta, which is the apparent volume of the chambers. So if you have a one liter chamber physically, uh, you expect it to act like a one liter chamber, but because of mixing and because of things that may go on in that chamber, uh, there may be side streams, there may be short circuits, all of those kinds of things, the, um, the chamber does not always act as if it were that single liter chamber in volume. So it could act like it was a 0.5 liter chamber, or it could act like it was a 1.5 liter chamber, changing the value of the distributions that come out. And mathematically, that can be expressed as a single parameter. So that gives you the apparent volume. Now, to sort of give away some of the, the talk, uh, beta is really something that allows you to distinguish between asthma and bronchitis. So when we've done it in people with bronchitis, beta tends to be less than one for a, a unit volume chamber. And it tends to be greater than one in asthmatics for a unit volume chamber. So it distinguishes very nicely between the asthmatics and the bronchitics on that basis. And the complete formula is down there in the bottom, um, which just describes uh, the shape of that uh, profile on the far right. <clears throat> and so we're simply seeing um, the products of resistance and compliance 
resistance being predominantly associated with the larger airways, compliance being uh, more associated with the smaller airways. Next slide. Uh, and if you look at the product of resistance and compliance, uh, the dimensions all cancel out except for time, as you see in the equation. Resistance is pressure per volume per time, whereas compliance is volume per unit of pressure. And so all that's left is time. And so each pathway from the mouth to the alveolus and back out to the mouth has a time constant associated with it. So to be able to measure that time constant, essentially what you want to do is inhale a stopwatch. You click the stopwatch on when you begin the inhalation. When you finish the exhalation, you click the stopwatch off and that tells you the transit time. And that transit time then is proportional to the resistance and the compliance of the subtending units. And that's really what we're doing with the aerosol. So the aerosol all goes in at the same time and then it is distributed because um, inhalation and exhalation does not um, have the same hysteresis curve, right? And so inhalation and exhalation has uh, different time constants associated with it. So that differential shows you a change in time constants, again, related to resistance and compliance, which gives you, in the end, the distribution. Uh, next slide. And so this is what the output looks like. <clears throat> in the red, that would be the volume inhaled rising and the volume exhaled falling in that red curve. And uh, as the person is going along, there is a pulse of aerosol introduced at a preset volume, which we call the volume of penetration. Volume of penetration is the difference between the midpoint of that inhaled bolus and the end of the inhalation. So that's why we try to have the patients breathe to approximately the same volume each time uh, because we want to be able to predict what the volume of penetration is going to be, uh, perhaps keep it the same. Um, although in the end, when the analysis is done, the analysis is done as a, a function of dimensionless time and uh, dimensionless volume. So we uh, essentially divide by the mean time and we divide by the volume of penetration uh, to essentially make all of the, the values come out to be approximately the same. And so this, this works very nicely as long as you don't get a lot of the aerosol uh, penetrating so deeply that it goes down into the alveoli. So once it's down into the alveoli, it's no longer um, convective ventilation that you're going to be looking at and uh, it does tend to smear the signal a little bit but uh, we we've noticed and the literature has noted that volumes of penetration up to about 600 cubic centimeters are pretty good even though the dead space is less than 250 cc's um, because the aerosol tends to trail out as it mixes and of course it's mixing at the bifurcations and this is, this is obvious proof that it's mixing at the bifurcations because we get mixing down to volumes of penetration that are essentially the, the, where the lung is starting off uh, 100 cc's or so. So you're just getting past the mouth and the head airways. Uh, next slide. Um, so we see this kind of homogeneity of ventilation uh, in the blue. Uh, it's pretty standard from individual to individual as long as they're asymptomatic. Uh, it is independent of their age. Um, I have done the test for the last 40 years and my results have not changed in the last 40 years. Uh, in addition to that, of course, we've, uh, in the literature at least, people have done both children and the elderly and uh, they see no difference in their uh, uh, ventilatory patterns based on this. Uh, but if you have someone with COPD, uh, the curve and the time constants tend to shift to a later time. That's equivalent to that beta value uh, being less than uh, one. And if you are an asthmatic, uh, 
uh, you see the short circuiting that is um, related to asthma in the upper airways, and you see the aerosol uh, exiting sooner than you would have expected it, uh, equivalent to a beta value uh, larger than one. And, and so that, that allows us to differentiate between the diseases we think fairly reliably. Uh, for um, the asthmatics that we've done so far, uh, probably the average value of beta is around 1.4 to 1.5, whereas for the COPD patients, it's probably between 0.5 and 0.7, uh, both of which are highly statistically significant. Uh, when I did my doctoral dissertation, we were trying to distinguish between smokers and non-smokers, uh, going down to a smoker with as little as two pack years, and we were able to actually distinguish individual smokers on that, on the basis. We looked at a total of 19 smokers, and on average, their p-value distinguishing them from the, the non-smokers was 0 0.000001. That's five zeros and a one. Um, next slide. And so this is essentially what the output's going to look like for the asthmatic uh, in red, uh, the smoker, COPD patient in green, and the asymptomatic in blue. So the, the asymptomatic falls between the asthmatic and uh, COPD patient. Next slide. And this is just a rundown of some of the papers that have been published uh, and the conclusions that they've come to. So well, the first conclusion was that aerosol spirometry is at least as sensitive as flow volume spirometry in detecting known alterations. It's simple to administer. It's independent of the tidal volume being used. It's independent of the breathing rate being used. Next slide. Um, in small ways, uh, aerosol spirometry appears to be more sensitive than standard spirometry because when we compared the smokers and non-smokers, we compared them on the basis both of their spirometry and uh, their aerosol spirometry, and the aerosol spirometry could distinguish better the smokers from the non-smokers than could standard flow volume spirometry. Uh, lung volume differences have no effect on the values derived from aerosol spirometry. Uh, and people are able to detect alteration in lung function due to asthma. And in fact, in asthmatics, they've used methacholine challenges and varying uh, doses of methacholine can be seen to um, take that beta value and make it larger and larger, the higher the dose of methacholine. Uh, so it is shifting more and more to the left to the earlier time. Um, it's correlated with uh, changes in specific airway conductance. And as I said, we saw uh, a good correlation coefficient between uh, plethysmography and the aerosol spirometry in our testing here at WVU. I think there's one more slide along these lines. Yeah. So it's at least as sensitive as specific airway conductance in detecting methacholine-induced airway constriction. Um, it seems to have higher sensitivity and specificity than uh, flow volume spirometry um, and uh, being able to separate, also being able to separate uh, patients with chronic bronchitis from those with chronic bronchitis and emphysema, which I think is important here, particularly for uh, people with CWP. And of course, it's actually been used on coal miners with CWP and does distinguish the CWP uh, from a normal um, outcome. Um, and correlated in patients with cystic fibrosis and uh, changes in proportion to the severity of the obstruction. Uh, so it kind of ticks off uh, pretty much all the check boxes that we've been able to think of so far. And I think the next slide is, yeah. And this just shows you some of the correlations. On the left is the one for, uh, the FEV1, FEC, and on the right for um, specific airway conductance. Uh, 0.77 for the FEV1, FEC percent predictive in the literature, which is what we found actually 
um, in our patients, and 0.96 for plethysmography, and that's pretty much, again, what we found here. Uh, so we've kind of duplicated those values. Next slide. Um, and so uh, we are able, uh, we were actually looking at several of the parameters and being able to come up with an equation to convert uh, the aerosol spirometer, the aerosol dispersion values to regular spirometry. And uh, these work fairly well, as you can see, for, for a number of different things. Uh, next slide. Okay, the demo. So if you could focus in on the screen here. The unit itself is about the size of a hairdryer with a tube on it. And uh, the, the engineer who helped build this is familiar with uh, uh, medical equipment and has sort of the standard uh, look of a piece of medical equipment. So the first screen that comes up is your list of patients, uh, which you can populate in advance. Obviously, once a patient's come through, they can be added to this list. Uh, or if you're seeing a patient multiple times, they will al already be on the list. They can be called up at the beginning of the day so that you're ready to go. Then you can, when the patient comes in, you go down to that patient, highlight them, say start, and um, if, you, if you can focus in a little bit more on the screen, I'll show you what happens. And of course, what you wanna do uh, is this has a technique for calibrating the volume on it every day. So you can take out your uh, syringe your flow syringe and check the volume calibration on it and of course it's using kind of the same standard pressure transducers that uh, <clears throat> you would use with spirometry although the range on the pressure transducer is much smaller because uh, the pneumatac is not going to have as large a, a change at the lower volume uh, at the lower flow rates that we're we're doing and then if you can come if you can Bring it in even a little more. Is that about it? Okay. So essentially, um, we would start the test at this point. Um, it takes a second uh, to let the aerosol warm up. Then it'll tell the patient to breathe. What you'll see is there'll be a blue bar that rises right here. Uh, that's uh, indicating volume. So we'll have them, the patient bring the, uh, the blue bar up into the yellow. And we can do this without doing the test. We can just have them breathe so that they can see how the bar rises, how fast it rises, how fast it falls, and get used to that, which will take a couple of extra breaths. And then once that's done, the test is done. And so you can see here in the far right-hand corner, uh, there was a pulse and an exhale pulse, inhale and exhale. The test has been done one time. If you want them to do it again, they can press down on the trigger, wait a couple of seconds. Uh, you can see the old test scrolling across and The test has now been done two times. A third time, same maneuver. Fourth time, same maneuver. So in four times, you'll double your sensitivity by power calculations. Um, so if you think that you need greater sensitivity, um, you can do that by signal averaging. <clears throat> and, and that's the test. Uh, eventually, essentially, once this is done, um, We get a permanent record. Dr. McCauley, there was a question. It says, so the breath is a tidal breath, not a forced maneuver? It's a tidal breath, yeah. 
Uh, so we can make that title breath any volume we want within reason. Uh, you want to be able to, uh, the bolus itself is about 50 cc, so you want to be able to follow that bolus with about twice that volume of air. So essentially the um, lowest volume of penetration you probably want to go to is about 100 cc's, but um, in fact you don't, you'd want to go past 100 cc's because that's pretty much the mouth and the the, the trachea right there. So to get it into the lungs, you, you need a volume of penetration greater than 100 cc's anyway. Um, but no, it's, it's not forced at all. Uh, the patients who have performed it uh, like it. They give the pulmonary techs a very hard time when they have to go do spirometry right after this, or plethys, especially plethysmography right after this. So we apologize for that part. Um, and uh, the company that makes this uh, is uh, looking at uh, having uh, some partnerships that allow them to make a lot of these. Right now, um, the, I have probably just the beta test versions of this. Uh, essentially, there's about $500 worth of components in the, in the device. Uh, and so it, it would cost about what a CPAP would cost. Uh, the company, if it made money on it, probably would make money from cost savings on the patients, keeping the patients out of the emergency room, essentially. Is this FDA approved? Not yet. Uh, we are just pulling together the information on it. Um, it's started into the FDA process, and so um, they expect probably to have the, the one thing that's holding them back is having a full production capability set up yet. Um, so they're, uh, they're pulling together the funds to, to have their production uh, line set up because the FDA wants to see these in production before they approve them. Uh, but as uh, we've run uh, the, uh, the aerosol through uh, FDA to get their approval on that, and they, it's a corn oil that's being used and the corn oil came out of FDA as grass, generally regarded as safe. And the amount that the patient gets is, we know, the same as you'd get if you walked into a kitchen where somebody was frying with corn oil on the stove. Uh, so it's not an excessive concentration. And it's been passed by our IRB here as well. So... Um, so it's that, not used anywhere clinically. It's uh, not. It's been used um, for research, not for standard clinical practice so far. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you want to go back to the PowerPoint, we have a couple of minutes. Let me talk about the dihydroberberine briefly. Thank you. Um, so dihydroberberine uh, is uh, Chinese traditional medicine, essentially. Uh, the berberine form, without the two, uh, the two hydrogen groups on it, is uh, known in China for uh, treatment of diarrhea. And uh, actually, they discovered through the treatment of the diarrhea that they were getting changes in... Uh, in diabetic patients uh, as well. So they, it, it was returning their blood sugar to normal. Uh, and so um, the, the method of action is thought to be as an antioxidant. And in the next slide, uh, it has a, the dihydroberberine has a nitrogen group that is not charged. And that's the reason why the dihydroberberine is used uh, as, the, as the first metabolite that the body sees because without the charge on the nitrogen, it will pass more easily through the cellular membranes. Uh, once inside the membrane, the cell then converts it back to berberine, which is the active ingredient. Um, and uh, the berberine is then an antioxidant inside the cell itself. But the, the dihydro is there so that uh, it doesn't have to be metabolized by uh, bacteria in the gut. 
because uh, that makes it uh, somewhat tricky. It's been noted that dihydroberberine, or excuse me, berberine, uh, loses some of its efficacy over time. And the, the suspicion is that it's not being as absorbed as well in the gut, whereas the dihydroberberine uh, is known to be absorbed better in the gut because it's not charged and is also known to convert back in the cell to berberine, which, by the way, then keeps it in the cell because the berberine can't pass out of the membrane uh, until it's metabolized. Uh, next slide. And so these are just, uh, it's, the dihydro is just one of a number of metabolites of berberine, which is there in the center. Uh, most of the time, uh, most of the known um, metabolites of berberine still have a charged nitrogen group. Uh, and so they still have the same issue with passing the cellular membrane that berberine has. Uh, next slide. And this is a number of uh, outcomes, if you can, if they're large enough, for, hopefully for you to read, uh, from treatment with the berberine. So it seems to have uh, application in a number of different diseases, which as an antioxidant, you might suspect it would anyway. Um, next slide. Um, so, um, this is uh, how the, uh, the mode of action is thought to work uh, with berberine. Um, I'm not going to go into these because I'm not a biochemist, but uh, these are all kind of uh, uh, the, the sorts of regular reactions that you'd see from antioxidants. So it does have that uh, seeming antioxidant property. Uh, but you will notice down in the lower right, uh, TGF beta uh, blockage, which is responsible for uh, ECM production and collagen accumulation, and is basically the profibrotic response. Uh, it does seem to block that. And so, while it would not change uh, fibrotic cells to epithelial cells, because there's, I don't think there's anything that does that, uh, it could block uh, further fibrogenesis. And that's why we're kind of interested in it. And we were thinking of using uh, the berberine in a study uh, with minors, uh, particularly with simple pneumoconiosis, to block further progression of the pneumoconiosis. Check that against both the standard spirometry and the aerosol spirometry, uh, using it to try to pick up more sensitive changes. And then also use it with um, blood uh, to look at various markers of fibrogenesis and see what markers of fibrogenesis might change after berberine is administered. Uh, the presumption being the berberine would slow fibrogenesis, uh, which would um, uh, decrease some of the markers that we were finding for the inflammation there in it. So it would be interesting to see, for example, if it's just the TGF beta, or if we're seeing things like TNF alpha uh, changing as well, and, and what might be the best markers for trying to pick some up. So it's, it's kind of backing into the whole question of, of marker identification for co-workers pneumoconiosis. And that's, that's part of why we're interested in this. And if it works to slow fibrogenesis, uh, so much the better. Next slide. Um, and so it has been used for uh, control of bleomycin induced pulmonary fibrosis in rats and, uh, and works extremely well for that. Uh, it um, uh, is similar to some other Chinese medications. Uh, this we know that uh, from the work that's been done in China, the uh, berberine itself has very, very few side effects uh, and very few synergistic effects with uh, uh, any other drugs uh, so that it does not tend to, to block other pharmaceutical action. Okay, next slide. And all, it also works with paraquat-induced fibrosis in rats. Uh, and so, 
Uh, it's been tried somewhat extensively, particularly in animals. Uh, but we think that uh, being an antioxidant, at least in theory, it should work for fibrogenesis in humans as well. Uh, next slide. And so here are some of the interactions. Uh, some of the interactions, in fact, are good. Um, uh, it's, it's similar in its, um, its effects and its mode of action to the tetrandrine, if you're familiar with that. There was some work done uh, in NIOSH back in the early 90s on tetrandrine. And in fact, tetrandrine is, is used extensively in China now uh, for treatment of fibrogenesis. Okay, um, next slide. Any questions? Can I ask a question here, which is how, how is, berb, is the um, berberine administered? Is that oral or yes. is it aerosol? Uh, no, aerosol. you can do it um, orally, uh, but there's nothing that could stop it from being aerosol. Actually, uh, the berberine itself uh, can be produced in an oil type form, and so be perfect for an aerosol, and could be directed towards a lung volume in which we were, were seeing uh, fibrosis. And in fact, with the, uh, the other interesting thing about the aerosol spirometer that we have not done a lot with is locating uh, where obstructions are with the aerosol, uh, because you can, in fact, choose various volumes of penetration, which I didn't go into before, to look to see if uh, what volume is more associated with uh, larger changes and whether uh, or not you have, it's normally simply a linear uh, uh, function with volume of the amount of dispersion that you get. But um, we think that in people who have obstructions in specific, at, at specific lung volumes that we'll be able uh, to identify and locate those and then treat them with an aerosol as well. And the best form in which to put the aerosol is probably an oil droplet so that it doesn't grow, so that we can generate it. I, I didn't mention that the aerosol that we're using here is generated at, at 0.7 micrometers so that it tends not to be deposited and lost. But if you want to deposit it, uh, you can. You can do that a couple of different ways and enhance deposition. Um, without changing the particle size, one of which would simply be breath holding at the end of the breath because a 0.7 micrometer particle uh, will deposit about 25 or 30 uh, percent with a 5 to 10 second breath hold in most air spaces. Did anybody have any questions or comments or anything? I know Dr. Dalil, you had a couple. I can share him with, share those with him. Uh, he said really great explanatory language, uh, translating chemical engineering jargon and concepts to healthcare workers. And it reminds Dr. Doyle of the thick principle originally and still used to measure cardiac output. Yes. And in fact, in congestive heart failure, we do see changes in the ventilatory pattern. And in fact, you could conceivably pick up congestive heart failure uh, with this same device. Do, do you want to mention, which, I, I said there was a correlation table in there, but the, of the values currently derived from, from spirometry, which ones can be calculated or derived from this technique? Well, uh, we chose the FEV1, FEC percent predicted because um, Spirometry is so dependent upon um, the FEV1, for example, will change with height and weight and age. And we know we're not going to get change with height, and weight, and age with this, with homogeneity of ventilation. So, so it calculates, calculates the ratio very well. Yeah, right. Okay. Any of the other values that are, I mean, as far as um, lung volumes or... Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's any other ones that are estimated. Yeah, no, it's it's actually independent of those because, um, and, and so no good at, at determining 
what the function is. But the idea is, in fact, that what you're, you're really after by determining all of those other things you have to remember is you're after ventilation. Because you're either going to measure, measure ventilation or you're going to measure perfusion, because those are the two jobs that the lung does. So if you can measure ventilation directly, you can kind of throw out all of the extra variables that you would normally have to measure to kind of try to approach what the ventilation changes are doing. Uh, so this will give you the ventilation directly, essentially. And it'll give it to you in a form uh, that you're familiar with, uh, but then you have to also understand that it's probably the only thing that you might have to know uh, at that point. Great. If there are any questions, uh, you're welcome to use the chat function or there's a, like a little raise your hand function after the ellipses up at the top of your box. If you ever want to speak, I just wanted to let everybody know that because I know you're all muted right now. <laughs> and what we're hoping to do, in fact, is uh, with uh, some of the other units the company produces is to put these out in some of the black lung clinics and start working more with the miners to look more at COPD because um, although Muir did this a little bit of this work back in the late 60s and early 70s, nothing has been done since that time with coal miners, which seems kind of a shame since that's where it all started. And particularly for, you know, we, were, uh, we had a, uh, a long dialogue on PMF uh, on Friday with folks from NIOSH. They showed the... Um, frontline uh, video and the people who were in that from NIOSH were there to talk to us. Uh, and so we were talking about detecting PMF and the, and the problem with it is that by, you, by the time you detected PMF, you may well be too late to, to really be of any assistance. And so with something like berberine, which potentially, or any of the other antioxidants that you can give, that uh, you may be able to treat it if you catch it early. So the idea is, what are the things that we can use for early detection with PMF? And can, is it even possible to do something that you could call early detection of PMF? Um, and, and I think that's, that's a salient question that, that we should ask and try to answer at least. Because if there is something uh, then we should act on it. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Our next session is March 4th. Um, I'll continue to bother you guys about sending in some cases. I know you must have some. Um, and if anybody didn't get to introduce themselves on the call today, please email me so I can get you recorded for attendance. But other than that, everybody have a wonderful day. And before everyone signs off, just a little reminder that this Thursday is the CEO advisory committee meeting. It's um, a quarterly um, telephone conference, or at least three quarters out of the year, it's, it's over the telephone. So if you see your administrator, please encourage them to attend. Thank you, everybody. Happy Monday. Bye. I have a conflict of interest that I wanted to make sure I made because I didn't make it up front. I should have. So on the company that makes this device particularly, um, I got stock uh, for my original design. And so I, I'm part owner of, of what I was talking about. All right. Great. Thank you, guys.